Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta with my friend, Catherine Edwards. How are you, Catherine? I'm really good. I'm sitting there having my radiance. And um, yeah, I, I'm pretty good. Probably like everyone else watching this. Um, a lot going on, isn't there? A lot going on in all sorts of areas. But yeah, I'm in a good place. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I, Catherine, I know we've talked about this off camera, but I have made one video talking about this on camera. But you guys, Catherine and I, with a few of our other friends from YouTube, are at this moment looking into doing a wellness retreat 2024 towards the summer, fall time. And I've actually got some leads. And so I'm super excited about that. That's something that I'm really looking forward to. And I'm so happy, Catherine, that we can kind of start to plan something like that for our greater audience to have a legit coffee chat. <laughs> oh, it's just going to be amazing because, you know, I've done this sort of thing before and it is so special. And Bryce, I'm not going to give much away, but Bryce has sent me some of the pictures of the places she's investigating. And it is going to be the perfect location to connect with each other, connect with nature, connect back with our roots. And I, I, I'm so excited for this. It's just going to be amazing. And I know that it's just going to be divine who comes together for this experience. Me too. And I thank you guys so much for giving us the feedback in my video uh, update video I put up. Everybody seems very excited about this. And of course, a lot of people ask about prices that we won't know that until we know it. Like we're still investigating. I, I told Catherine, there's a lot of places I've met. My friend Cindy, who Catherine knows, you guys know, she's going to help us too. And she's done this before as well. And so she knows some places and, and the different price ranges and what they offer. So once we have that all figured out guys we're not going to really have a know a price until we've got it all figured out uh, we will absolutely let you guys know and let's and start their enrollment and all that kind of stuff and it'd be just so fun to have like a legit sit down to talk to everybody and have these weird wacky conversations in person with everybody there's nothing like it there's absolutely nothing like it so i just can't wait and it's coming along well and all the ideas and the people that are going to be hosting it with us. We have got an amazing team of people together. There is literally something for everyone. It gives me chill bumps. Yeah, it's going to be yeah, literally <laughs> great. <job. laughs> so, guys, just keep just keep your just keep your eyes out. Once we have everything, we will absolutely let you guys know. Once we have it, once we know everything, you will you will obviously be the first to know after we know. So. Speaking of that, we have a very interesting conversation today. I thought that we could kind of, because usually in our coffee chats, we, we we talk a lot about like life issues that we're kind of going through and our different perspectives and opinions, just like you would do with the friends over coffee. Well, this is kind of a combination of a deep dive and a modern day conversation. And we're going to be talking about the, I'm going to call it the Kellogg conspiracy. Um, you guys know that Catherine and I, one thing that Catherine and I have in common is our interest in wellness, health, and of course, that leads into the spiritual health as well, because the health, the, the physical health also plays into the mental and the spiritual too. And, you know, we've done these shadow work challenges where we've talked about people getting up first thing in the morning and exercising, but a lot of people, what about breakfast? What about breakfast? Well, you guys, Kellogg was the company who created the marketing as breakfast being the most important meal of the day. But is it? Is it? So I'm going to put some links down in the in the uh, description box below, guys, of some hysterical videos that I ran across when I was reading this or researching this. And this isn't going to be a big deep dive. I'm just going to discuss just a little bit about Dr. John Kellogg and his brother, Will Kellogg, who are the two brothers that really made Kellogg big. There's one video called um, where I have it. Meet the psychopath who invented your breakfast. That's one. I mean, that's an instant. That guy did a really good job. But basically, the Kellogg brothers, and I, I do know that there is a Kellogg descendant who has been a whistleblower. So we do know from her perspective and her life experiences that there is something very shady about this family. All right, from her perspective. But we know that the Kelloggs, they um, they were born into a really big family. There were like 17 kids in this family. And um, they were very religious, Seventh-day Adventists. Do you guys have Seventh-day Adventists in the UK? I haven't heard of it, but that doesn't mean we haven't got it because I'm not really big on religions at all. So right. I'm not sure. The, the Seventh-day Adventists, they're what we would call like an American 
like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses are like an American flavor of Christianity. They're very, they're more aligned with the Jehovah's Witnesses, extremely conservative. They believed very much teaching the end times that the end of the world is coming. Jesus is coming back soon. Very hellfire and brewing, all that kind of stuff. So John and his brother Will, along with all their siblings, grew up in a very uh, a family that did not actually push education, which a lot of these Jehovah's Witnesses don't either, because they think the world's going to end soon. So, you know, I mean, in some ways I'm laughing because in some ways they're kind of right. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but, but, not, but I'm not as doom and gloom. We're not as doom and gloom as they are. So John Kellogg, who was the physician, he was he's considered an American businessman, an inventor, and a physician. So how did this guy that went from parents who did not educate their children go, become a physician? Well, back in the 1800s, he was born in 1852. His brother, Will, was born in 1860. So in the 19th century, century, you guys have to remember, this was before the federal reserve this is before the educational system as we know it today what they would do is so john read a lot he was basically self-educated according to what the research says and the church actually paid for him to go to what medical school was considered to be at that time now here in the United States, for a doctor, I, I you know different countries do it differently. Obviously, you have your high school education bar; everyone's got to go through that, and then you have your undergrad, which is where you get your bachelor's of science or bachelor's of art. If you're going medicine, you're going to get a bachelor's of science. That's a four year program, and then you have to take what's called the MCAT, which is a test to go to medical school, which is many, many, many years, and then you have residency depending on what type of. Uh, so now, to be a doctor, it's a lot more intense than it was back then. Back then, it was more of like an apprenticeship so you know and there, there are things about john kellogg's beliefs that i actually very much agreed with like he was a vegetarian he promoted uh, exercise um he knew that that our diet was important to to our overall quality of life um and so but again it goes back to that thing that darkness can't create anything only the light can so a lot of these ideas start from truth and then get inverted and manipulated. And uh, John Kellogg himself was a bit of an eccentric character. Did you watch the video I sent you? You watched the video and the fact of him cycling around on his bike with his cockatoo on the on his shoulder. I thought, well, I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, after he finished medical school, he was then put in charge, John, the doctor, of running the sanitarium. They called him the sanitarium back then, which me thinks it makes me think of like. A crazy place but it's more, it was more like a spa like this wellness spa where these very very wealthy the elite of that time would come to for wellness um we have people like henry ford uh the rockefellers loved this this wellness center right that's a big name yep henry ford is another big name inventor of the car um a president war uh, President Warren Harding, Thomas Edison, Amelia Earhart, before she took her famous flight where she disappeared, was at this spa. So we have a lot. This is the the this is a wellness center spa. Speaking of wellness centers, ours is not going to be this fancy, guys. <laughs> it's not going to be. But we're certainly not going to be doing some of the treatments that he's got. No, yeah. no. I mean, he did do things like colonics, which I've done colonics before. Like, and that's a and also that's light that. therapy. He yeah. was into light therapy as well. Absolutely. He figured out like synthetic light it can cause light, can help the body rejuvenate. Um, yeah, but they laughed a lot about the colonics. And I'm like, you know, that's in the Vedic text. It's a Kriya in the Vedic text cleaning out your colon, you know, and um, and and he but he also guys, he also was big in the germ therapy, which are germ theory, excuse me, germ theory, which is not something that I Germ theory is basically what's gotten us a lot into trouble, I think, with the prop. Uh, I won't say too much, but with like the propaganda of of the fancy sicknesses that have been going going around. Um, I I follow. I I believe more of German new medicine, where sickness is not as simple as just germs. There's something bigger hap happening with the body. But anyway, that's a, a conversation for a different day. But he was also a eugenicist. and that is where there's the e even bigger red flag. Right. Somebody who cares about someone's quality of life and their wellness typically is not a eugenicist. And so, Catherine, for the people who don't know what a eugenicist is, do you want to ex kind of ex should we explain what that is? Basically, it's population control. 
population control and in terms of but normally i mean i'm, I'm not an expert in it but thank god <laughs> but normally they the, it's very prescriptive in terms of you know they want to get rid of certain parts of the population right so therefore it's quite an elitist idea generally speaking that those that don't i mean we're all used to the term that are useless eaters that we all yeah. know about now but it's normally where they've decided that there's too many people um and they've decided they want to decide who are the worthy ones to survive and who are not yes there it lies a lot of the issue absolutely so we know a lot of our um controllers today are open about their belief in eugenics like bill gates um all, yes. i won't say much more because it's it's yeah. you know, um, but yeah, it's not just that we're overpopulated, it's we're overpopulated and these are the people that need to go. Yeah. Right. And they died. Yeah. And no one else has a say in it. Yeah. Absolutely. So it, that's where the, a lot of the controversy with these comes into because of, of some, and you guys can do your own research into the history of that and some situations that have happened where certain populations have been. Mm. So very, very um, cringy with that. But uh, Will Kellogg was his little brother. Will Kellogg was kind of, I mean, what kind of makes me laugh is like he kind of, and I, I don't want me to say he abused him, but he kind of was a little, he was kind of a bully to his little brother. I oh, mean, he, he, it was like he was his slave more than yes. his brother. I mean, his, his brother was uh, eight years younger than him. Um, and uh, that video where he's like pedaling around on his bike and his total white outfit with his cockatoo on his shoulder his brother would have to run and follow him and write down every word he said he would have to follow him to the bathroom and write down every word that john Ke it almost seemed like john kellogg maybe was a little asperger's i don't know or yeah. so there was something going on that wasn't completely you know typical uh, probably neuro neurodivergent or whatever they call it whatever the word is nowadays so what what happened was though they ended up creating a a cereal we all we all know the Kellogg cereal, and I don't want to go too deeply into the detail about how this cereal was made. But the thing about Kellogg's cereal, in my in my experience as a vegetarian, of course, I've had a lot of these. These we grew up with Kellogg's. Everyone, I think, yeah. grew up with a box of Kellogg's in their house. But I remember, even as a child, a bowl of cereal never really held me over to yeah. lunch like i remember always being really hungry before lunch but he created this from um it, it started in uh, 1877 it was the start of the corn flake which is flour oats and oatmeal um but it was so tough that it a uh, 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 a client at their spa broke her tooth and so they had to start breaking them into little pieces now according to this video that i'll place in the description box below they accidentally left some dough out overnight and it kind of fermented itself and so i think it was will who decided well let's just try it and ended up breaking into these really nice little flakes like you see with the cornflake cereals today and so um basically uh, by 1898 will kellogg became the um kind of the entrepreneur the business one that was like we need to like make this a household product where john kellogg was like no we're not doing this john kellogg was more like i'm gonna stay at the sanitarium um they ended up like suing each other they went through a lot of legal battles and uh will kellogg ended up owning then the rights to the kellogg name and that's how kellogg ended up becoming one of the biggest uh brands in the world, I would gather to say kind of like Coca-Cola, everybody, every country knows Kellogg, knows the rooster that's on the box of Kellogg. I mean, you thinking about fraud. I mean, it's so many different brands of cereal now that are owned by Kellogg. Um, they even uh, went into, they were the first company to have a toy inside the box. Did you guys have that as, as kids? Yeah. Yeah. We had toys inside of our, our cereal boxes. They were the first to include a nutritional label. Um, they were extremely good at marketing, obviously. And of, of course, part of that was, again, that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, is it? That's, again, where we come back to this. And so, and again, I noticed that a lot with these shadow work challenges where people, where I ask, hey, if you can do it in the morning, that's the best time to do it. Because that's the Brahma Morita. That's the Eastern philosophy. Try it. See how it sets your day up. And people are like, what about breakfast? What about breakfast? We've been so indoctrinated to believe that we need to eat right away when we wake up. And that's not necessarily true. Now, this is where I'm going to bring Kath, because Catherine's a biologist, so she understands the way the human body works. Now, Catherine, I was watching another doctor. A little clip came up on Instagram where the, another doctor was saying, please stop eating when you first wake up. Do yeah. not eat 
your liver produces like a, a sugary, there's a substance, the liver or a chemical, the liver will produce that gives you a surge of energy first thing in the morning. And when you eat first thing in the morning, it messes up the body's biological rhythm with what the liver is doing. And um, and I noticed, because I'm, I'm very adamant about exercising first thing when I wake up and I always have energy to, I mean, it's hard to get started, but once I get started, I feel that burst of energy. So I'm going to let you take it from here, Catherine, with your thoughts on this. Well, it's such a fascinating discussion, Vice, because obviously I'm laughing now because what we've been taught about the evolution of humans and our, you know, caveman and ancestry and hunter gatherers, now everything's up for grabs. You know, what really, where really did we come from? But from a basic, if we, we look at other animals in nature, we are the only species apart from pets that humans take into their homes where we don't have to go out and forage or hunt for our food. So most animals are evolved to actually, when they wake up, whether they're nocturnal or, or, or awake in the day, diurnal, you, would, you wouldn't normally have a refrigerator to open. So the whole point is the exercise would come before. So when you wake up, you've got your hormones, which are balancing your, your – we're designed to actually, you know, wake up at dawn and go to bed at dust, which, of course, most of, most of us don't do anymore. But if you take it right back to what we've been told about our ancestry or what we see with animals that are alive today, so it does make sense – you wouldn't get up and eat straight away. You'd get up. You'd normally try and find something to drink if you had access to that. And you'd go out and forage or hunt for your food. So you'd get that physical exercise, which then, of course, gets everything working, gets your lymphatic system working, gets the liver flushing out first to prepare you for whatever you manage to forage or hunt. So in some respects, do I think breakfast is really important? Yes, but it's what you count as breakfast and when you take it. So just like you and I have had um, discussions about dog nutrition, it's not just what you eat, it's when you eat it. Right. So yeah. you do, most people generally do need to, to balance their blood sugar, eat something healthily before they really set off into the day. But by that, I would normally mean, you know, possibly a couple of hours yeah. after you've been up, not ever get out of bed and eat mm -hmm. straight away. And that's purely been caused by our modern lifestyle, really started, in my understanding, in the Industrial Revolution, where people had to get up, go into factories, and so they would be shut in a factory for a 12-hour shift, and if they didn't have something before they went, they lost their chance to eat for the day. And that's they, they brought that up in this, I think it was the video with that. I watched a couple of videos that with the industrial yeah, it wasn't revolution. in the one you sent me, but you see, it's all completely out of sync with nature because, of course, yeah. we don't go to bed in line with nature anymore no. because we've got artificial lighting so we can stay up in the evenings was before people wouldn't have had lighting and they couldn't afford to keep burning candles a lot of people so they went to bed with the you know and they woke with the seasons and with the daylight so our bodies unfortunately fitting our bodies into the modern way of living has disastrous effects on our digestive system therefore our immune system our gut health so and also the whole point about the Kellogg's thing, it was fascinating listening to some of the research because, as you say, some of the ideas, you're like, yeah, that's good, that's right, that's right. But how they then manipulated that into coming up with something that's so disastrous for every human. I mean, there's yeah. nothing healthy to eat a commercial bowl of cereal at all. It's just going to spike your blood sugar horrendously yeah. and set you off for a disastrous day of cravings. Absolutely. Um, well, that's what that one doctor said. You need to be up for at least two hours before yeah. you eat anything. And that's enough. So with the Eastern philosophy, you know, we are we do our practice, we sweat, we we work, work out, if you want to call it, in what they call the Brahma Morton times, which is right when you wake up, like it's right when you wake up. And so and they don't want you eating anything because when you exercise in a very taking spirituality out of it when you exercise your blood is going to move away from the the organs into the muscles into the fascia now your blood is your sacred dna and so the blood the flushing of the blood is what creates a pattern of wellness right because you're you're you know you think about cupping like that's big right to cup and yeah. what they're looking for a cupping the way to explain it you know when you get a cup and they pull it up and there's a big bruise like a hickey almost 
what they've done, the Chinese doctor used to work with would explain it like it's like a car crash where the, the cars are just sitting there. And so the cup pulls the, the old blood up so new blood can come in. This is yeah. why things like inversions are important because like the calves, your calf muscles are your second heart. It's responsible yeah. for pulling the blood from your lower body back up to your heart for it to be cleansed and re recycled. So when you're working out, when you're exercising, the blood is going to do what it's supposed to do to, to help you and help that wellness that helps start to come. It's got to leave the digestive tract. Now, if you have eaten something, that's why you get cramps. If you eat something and you go for a run and your stomach cramps, like your the blood has to leave and go. You're, you're confusing your system, right? You Completely. Can't... Biologically, it's an absolute disaster because then you've got food sitting in your digestive tract that hasn't got the life force, the blood, the digestive enzymes, all that energy has been diverted away. And therefore, it's sitting there and almost fermenting and not digestible. So by the time you then stop the exercise and come back to it, the whole natural cycle has been broken. And therefore, you set off this sort of you started. We all know how important it is to start your day properly, yeah. mindset wise, gratitude wise. Um, but if you then start it wrong by eating straight away and then going off and exercising or rushing off to work or running to catch the train or whatever, your body is in a constant state of stress, just like if a wild antelope or an animal had eaten a meal and then was suddenly chased by a lion, that's a massive stress response and you're almost keeping your body in there. Um, and so it's a real, real disaster. And the problem is, is most people's lifestyles are a set up so they're always in a rush in the morning so they're trying to frantically put something in apart from doing say what you and i do for different reasons of getting up loads of time before we start work i go out and my exercise is doing the animals which of course is getting your calves moving a lot so long as you're wearing the right footwear so if you're wearing welly boots and something that doesn't let you move properly you're not pumping those calves, different story. But I find it so fascinating, Bryce, with the whole Kellogg stuff, is about how, in one respect, with this sanatorium and the well, the obsession with wellness, and then ending up with something that is just completely, oh, yeah. it's like, you know, the invention of chemotherapy. Oh, we've right. got all this petroleum, let's turn it into drugs after the yeah. war. You've gone from one sort of scenario to the worst possible you know, implementation of it to say, well, if you are going to have something, eat this processed rubbish full of God knows what. That right when you wake up, because it's the most important meal of the day. No, 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 darling. Your body that God created, that nature created, that's, they know this. I, I feel like they know this. And it's so funny. Because it's like the sanitarium was the rich and the elite that was getting all the good, the good practices. And then they were sending out the crap to us. Yeah, right? Remember, they're, they're eugenicists. They they're, they practice eugenics. And right? it's making you completely dependent on the system because then you're starting off, you're going to have this indigestible stuff in your system that's going to yeah. spark your blood sugar, that's then going to give you a massive crush. So then what are you going to do in the limited time you've got in your lunch hour? You're going to go and grab something for instant satisf satisfaction to try and get your body back into balance. That's then going to make it even more. So you then have not got the physical resilience or the mental resilience to make good life lifestyle choices how you start off that first meal of the day this is why things like you know drinking lemon water and things like this is so important because they're helping flush those toxins out of the body before you pop most and let's face it most of the food that a lot of us have got access to is really hard for the body to digest and use absolutely and as you're saying that too like you know i have a friend in yoga who says you're only as happy as your colon is healthy yeah, and that's true. And we, I, we think a lot about how, you know, so many cleanses a day advertise saying, oh, you've got seven years of poo basically stuck in your colon, all this kind of stuff. Obviously, Dr. John Kellogg knew this because he was performing colonics on his on his patients. He knew the value of a clean colon. And as Catherine's saying, when that stuff gets fermented because you're you're out of sync with your body and you're just putting more and more and more on top of it. You know, you, you can see it in people's eyes when their colon is backed up. The eyes start to look bad. They start to get rings under their eyes. It, and and the, the colon is the, the trash system of the body. And so if, if the colon is compacted, 
and it's you're constipated or you sometimes people don't even realize they're constipated they don't, they, they don't even realize that's what's going on the body the blood system can't bring any more to the any more stuff to the colon to to eliminate it so it holds it in other areas of the body you're killing yourself basically completely you know? poisoning yourself yeah. and you know, your colon is part of your gut when we talk about the gut microbiome most people sort of think of the stomach and the first part of the digestive system but it's not it's everything from your mouth nose sinuses all the way through until it comes out the other end and your microbiome in the colon is absolutely crucial to every part of physical and emotional health and it's really, really hard for most people now to keep that healthy because of the sedentary lifestyle we live. You know, even the difference in my lifetime from as children, how we had to walk everywhere and you were out playing all the time everywhere and outside and your mum would say, come make sure you're home by dark sort of thing. Um, although I think my mum would have quite liked us to have just peered off someone not quite but, but I do, in all seriousness, you know, this is it. No wonder so many people are struggling so much because it and it, I do agree with you, Bryce, from the res research you sent through this with his level of knowledge. This had to be a deliberate ploy. Oh, absolutely. There's no way it was an accidental thing because he had far, far too much knowledge in the other areas of work that he was doing in the sanatorium to not realize the implications of what they were doing. Absolutely. And I get this a lot. We when part of this, like if you want to call it a great awakening, whatever, our the time of seeking is us realizing where we've been programmed. Mm -hmm. And I see that a lot in my yoga shala because we teach early in the morning and people are like, Well, what about breakfast? And I'm like, look, you're not gonna starve. Mm -hmm. You're gonna wake up in the morning and you're gonna come to the shala and you're gonna do your practice, and then after you're done practicing, you might, and the funny thing is, is for me and a lot of my students, the same thing happens is you'll practice, you know, think you're going to be starving by the end of it, but no, it takes about 30 minutes to an hour to actually feel, feel hungry because yeah. the body is still kind of, you got to allow the body to kind of settle back in, into its place. But people are so programmed and so brainwashed to at literally panic if they can't eat right away. And that's coming from Kellogg. Go guys, that's not coming from you. That is a programming of the brain. And and it's it's amazing. And I remember my grandmother who was so, you know, she's my grandmother who tried to teach me to meditate when I was eight. She, you know, I wish she was still alive because she was just hysterical. But she would say all the time, breakfast is not the most important of the middle of the day. She believed lunch was. Because and now looking back in Ayurvedic medicine, they would say the same thing because that's the pitta time where there's the fire time. So that's when the digestive yeah. system is really active. And she she was very um, aware that that was not correct. That breakfast was not the most important meal of the day. And I, I just I just hope that for people watching this, because I got that with the shadow work challenge as well. We got people asking when I when I encouraged people to try to start their day with exercise. Um, what about breakfast? What about breakfast? And I'm like. Well, it'll be there afterwards and you're not going to die. You're, you're not going to starve. You know, you can actually live on way less than most people think they can live on. You know, yeah, absolutely. way, way less. And, you know, it's all about quality. And when you do it, like when we take it to the dogs, you know, most people yeah. feed their dogs twice a day. And that can be really, really damaging for their digestive system. Not talking about puppies, of course, we're talking about adult dogs. But this is where I think, Bryce, everything that we've spoken about, it links into everything else we've spoken about because we're so over, over pushed this knowledge that is so wrong deliberately from these sources that are, you know, marketing experts and can put it in a way that sounds convincing if you're listening to it in a rush as part of the brainwashing and you haven't really got time to tune in properly with it. It's like, oh, yeah, of course, I've got to have something to eat before I go off to work for the day or before the kids go off to school. Um, but actually, when you start really tuning in to listen to your body like you do with your exercise, so I get up each morning and I go and do it takes me about an hour to do the first shift of morning animals and it's out in the weather and a lot of movement. And then I come in and I normally will have something to eat. Um, whereas my husband might go another couple of hours before he'll have something to eat, you know, because it does depend on your body type and, you know, your blood sugar regulation and also what your evening routine is. But I think particularly for the children now where 
they've got such terrible choices available to them and what we count as normal and what healthy is so out of the past so if you go to finland the type of thing you'd get served for breakfast would be completely different to america which would be completely different to the uk our norms become ingrained through the brainwashing not because there's any science or or any proper reason for it and let's face it you know it we are designed to either go out and catch something to eat which you would be very unlikely to do because most of the animals aren't going to be out first thing in the morning unless you really are up, up at the crack of dawn um and we'd go out and forage and we'd forage for fruit and vegetables and nuts and seeds and things and that's generally speaking what we would eat and that would give us a slow sustained release of energy yeah. in an easily digestible form because our guts were healthy and designed to keep them that was of course now a lot of people this is why there's so much outrage about plant-based diets and things and we're talking proper plant-based diets yeah. here not fake ones because most people's microbiome and guts are so damaged because of what's gone before that they can't process real food anymore. But when you heal your gut, and funny enough, I am just bringing out a nutrition course. I haven't told you about that for this exact reason, because it's sort of, you know, you're trying to go, you always say, I love the way you always say, Bryce, don't compare your day one to your year 10. Yeah. You know, you've been studying yoga for years, proper yoga. When I come along on the retreat, I'm not going to be comparing me that doesn't do yoga to what Bryce can do. There's no, no way there's going to be a match there. And this is the same with our poor digestive systems and our bodies. We've all been fed rubbish. And therefore, when you start turning over to a healthy meal, some healthy alternatives, some people don't immediately get the benefit or they get problems because their microbiome, their gut is so out of balance. But if you do it properly with a proper support and you gradually make those changes so your body's healing as you're putting step changes in place, then you're onto a complete winner and your whole every aspect your mental health your physical health your longevity your energy levels everything will transform so don't worry if you're struggling initially to make some of these changes and it's not easy it's just because you've got to go through that healing cycle and it's worth persevering oh 100 percent. i mean i'll tell you guys just something just random that might help you understand like how serious this actually is when a student is if we know that a student is struggling with constipation like if a student and we get you know because when you're doing yoga you really can feel you start to be able to feel where their things off we won't let them practice because when you are that compacted and you're doing all these shapes without that compaction these shapes are amazing because they're flushing out the organs they're but when you're that compacted you're actually bruising your organs that's how dangerous this is for the whole body and i agree with you catherine one thing they did say we're talking about the industrial revolution and how every and that's the thing about ayurvedic medicine as well is that it's also seasonal eating that there is food, certain foods you're going to need in this in certain seasons certain foods you're going to not need in other seasons and we see how nature produces that for us then we try to bioengineer it to make it so the foods that are available in the spring are also available in the winter but that's that's not supposed to be that way right and then we wonder why we're all sick but um before the industrial revolution when people were living more royal rural lives on farms and or even people who lived in cities cities weren't really that big until the industrial revolution there was quite a ritual to meals and oh, so yeah. when people had to make breakfast like you were saying Catherine, you know they would have to actually go out and get the eggs go out and get the grains and so there was, a, there was an effort put into preparing that meal. So the breakfast meal wasn't right when they woke up. There was a few hours there of preparation where the body was waking up and adjusting before they, they digested that first meal. But then with the Industrial Revolution where people were getting <laughs> shipped off to factories, kids were working, this Kellogg cereal came out all over the world to give people oh don't worry wink wink we've got your breakfast for you just pour it in a bowl and pull, pour that milk in the milkman will come drop it off and you're good to go you don't even have to worry about breakfast you exactly. don't even, it's already done we've done it you're welcome we've done it for you and so it messed up the whole cycle to get people quickly into the which it, it's kind of a double-edged sword right not only are they screwing up our health but they're also giving us an opportunity to get to work faster to produce more for who for them Right. So 
I would just challenge people, like if you're one of those people that was terrified or is terrified to exercise first thing in the morning because you think you need to eat, or you have this like real belief that breakfast is the most important meal of the day, I would really challenge you to research this and ask yourself, how do you know breakfast is the most important meal of the day? Where's your data to back that? Like, where's the research to back that? Or is it because when, when it, what are you defining as breakfast? You know, what are you actually doing? Are you rushing up and grabbing? I think it's such a good point. I mean, tuning in and listening to your body. I've done quite a bit of studying with Paul Check. He's an most amazing holistic health coach, and he really teaches all of us to really tune in with you know how you feel emotionally, physically, energy wise after what you eat, what you drink. Yes. You do a lot of this in your shadow work challenge. And it's so important because look at the pattern, everyone. Everything of this is to get us not to tune in with ourselves, to, to skip our intuition, to sort of think, oh, my God, I'm feeling like this, but I'm told something different, so I need to stop listening to myself. It's a consistent theme over and over again. And if we just sort of, okay, might be a little bit more difficult if you've got teenagers, you know, getting them up early enough to have that time before they go to school. But if you're going off to work, start with yourself and so just say, I'm not going to eat straight away. The night before, I'm going to prepare something really healthy that I can eat when I get to work. Yeah. When I get to this place and just see how that shifts for you. Give it a few weeks to let your body adjust and just see the difference it makes for you and, and start listening to yourself not what these eugenicists are telling you. I know. <laughs> I mean, I, like everything they've told us was healthy is just like not. <laughs> it's just... Absolutely. No wonder people are confused. You know, for me, I've always said, Bryce, it's ridiculous that we need nutritionists. You know, no other species in the world needs a nutritionist. <laughs> but it's actually not ridiculous at all because everyone's so confused because we've been so brainwashed. But when you get that right for yourselves or your animals, oh, my God, suddenly you're not programmable. And that's so what they're Once you see it, you cannot see it. It's funny you say that too, Catherine, because um, our dog, Ravi, has been on the Catherine diet for a while now. And we order really, really, I mean, we spend more money on his food than ours. We order top line, very good food for him. But when we were traveling, we always spend the night halfway. And yeah. usually what we'll do is just there's a little grocery store down the street. We'll just go to the grocery store and get you know, the, the meat for him there at the grocery store. And normally it's fine, whatever. And then once we get to, to the house where we can go and get the good food again. But this past trip, Ravi turned his nose up at the food. We tried to give him at the hotel because he was like, this is not the, no, this is not the quality of food that I normally get. So he did, he was yeah. like, no, thanks. Like he just did not. So it's interesting because dogs, yeah, he has no idea. He doesn't know how much we pay. He doesn't even know what money is. He just knew he didn't want it because it, it wasn't the high quality that he normally gets, right? Absolutely. And they're so in tune. They can smell the bacteria. Yeah. They can smell the chemicals on it and everything, which unfortunately most of us, some yeah. of us, are, but most of us, our senses, they're so used to it. We're so full with so much stuff. So I just think this was so brilliant when you recommended this subject, Bryce, because if anyone delves into it, look at the links below for Bryce and start questioning you know, these common themes time and time and time again. And really just being gentle with yourself and saying, well, no wonder I'm confused by all this. Anyone would be when you're bombarded with such conflicting messages, because isn't that the perfect way to control people? Yeah. Just just bombard them with so much confusion. And at the end, they just submit and say whatever. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And especially with the, the slogan, breakfast is a, a slogan, uh, a logo and slogan together, slogo. Um, the, lo the logo, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. That's been around, guys, since like the 1920s. So it's not even, it's your parents' generation, it's your grandparents. Like that is so ingrained in us now. And it's a lie. Yeah. It's not true. Right. So um, that if that's the first thing, if you are new to this world of health conspiracy and like really trying to figure out what's good for you and what's not, that might be the first place you start is is breakfast the most important meal of the day? Is it really? Um, and, and it is it is once you start to get a handle on your eating, the times you eat, the quality of your food. Even for me, something that really, because I am Vata, so I do I'm, I'm better at like grazing during yeah, me too. I stop eating at 5 p.m. every night and I don't eat again until like nine or 10 o'clock the next day. 
Mm. Your digestive system, system also needs a chance to rest. And when I started doing that and giving myself that sleep and that long period where I'm sleeping to just not eat anything, man, I started to feel a lot better. My digestive system started working better, getting up, exercising. Then after, after I recover from it, then having breakfast, like it just makes, and you, t the food just tastes better. It tastes, you can really taste what you're eating. Whereas I think a lot, you're right. A lot of people just don't even, they're just eating so quickly. They don't even realize you know, Absolutely, yeah. and this is why it's so beautiful with so much, and this is why we're going to have such fun on our wellness retreat because that that shared experience of the gratitude of preparing good quality food and then allowing yourself time to eat it, it is just absolutely wonderful. It's what we're designed to do. Um, we haven't been able to do it as a human race for more centuries than god knows you know because it's just not been possible you know the rich have always overindulged the poor have just taken whatever's left so if they can get hold of anything and therefore i think this is this is why we're so passionate about when you take back that control when you start experimenting and started listening to yourself and it won't be overnight because we all know habits take a while to change because your body's got to change slowly but if you give yourself that time and you stay curious and you ask those questions and you start listening to yourself, not all these awful lies that are being fed to you, oh, my goodness. And imagine if we could treat it to teach our children to do this. Just imagine. Oh, yeah. 100. And the children and the young ones, the ones that are new to this earth, are already biologically programmed to know the truth. Just uh let my us that way did. you know you've only got to look at toddlers i won't go on for too much longer but my son always used to eat with his hands and 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 i used to tell him off because i'd say it was bad manners and now you say it's so important to eat with your hands because you're connecting with that energy and you're feeling it and if you see like he always knew he he as a toddler he knew what to forage straight away it was hysterical friends used to think uh, you know because he just thought he had this innate ability to know i'm not suggesting that's not dangerous sometimes <laughs> Obviously, I was keeping an eye on him. But also, if you watch a lot of children eat, they will automatically food combine. They'll eat this bit on their plate first. They'll eat that. Was we're taught to put a little bit of everything on our fork. And that's not how we'd eat in nature. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, we our children can teach us so much. And we can have that fun of getting back it's not too late for all of us listening to this and we can all learn and help each other and see what works but what works for you um will evolve over time as your body responds to the changes you're making i would love for i know we've got a lot of indian students who watch because indians eat with their hands too they have a way it's it's actually beautiful to watch it is amazing uh, i don't know how they do it because i'm western I, I know it's how not to beautiful when you watch me with no my when, 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 I'm like with messy the way that they're able to like it's like it's, a, amazing. Way that, it's amazing to watch them use their hands to eat or the they don't use their left hand, their right you've hand. Got that amazing connection you've got with the food it's just beautiful yeah it's amazing. There's so many traditional Indian restaurants you can go to in India where you eat on banana leaves. You don't even eat on yeah. an actual plate. You eat on a leaf. And there's a whole other conspiracy about the particles of this fake, you know, plastic and stuff getting in the food. You eat on, a, you sit on the floor instead of a chair, which is better for yeah. your lips, which then of course is better for your digestive. So I'd love for our Indian students to our Indian students listen. Like I'm, I'm in a yoga shala. Our viewers who are Indians to talk about using the hands to eat and how um especially if you're someone who's from india that maybe lived in india but now lives in a western country or something just kind of give your i'd love to hear your thoughts on that because it's amazing i'm a mess in india like it's messy for me but to watch them actually it's just an art you, where they scoop the food and you think about it most things in nature this morning i went out for a lovely dog walk with um can you see lola in the background there? <laughs> um with my daughter and we've got the sweet chestnuts are out everywhere at the moment and of course I make sure I leave loads for the squirrels and the wildlife but I picked a whole load because my my um we were going to make sweet chestnut soup and also the horses love them and because the horses are in the fields not free raising they haven't got any chestnut trees in their paddocks so I picked this great big bag of sweet chestnuts but then when I walked past the deer part the deer were desperate for them so we haven't got them we gave them to the deer but this is what the thing if you think most things in nature you would be able to pick them up and eat them because they weren't slop they yeah. weren't 
this rubbish. They were stuff that, you know, you'd pick this off the tree, you'd pick the berry, you'd pick the nuts, you'd, okay, you do grab lumps of meat and rip it off with your thing. So this is the thing. It's no wonder we're designed to do that because real food you can pick up with your hands. Oh, we, we do that with mushrooms. We, we go up, we don't, we go up to the mountains and we're up there whenever we see mushrooms, we forage and we pull the mushrooms up. And uh, my boyfriend knows a lot about mushrooms. And so he'll, he'll use them. Um, and he used to, he used to sell them to restaurants yeah, um, you know, it's curry leaves. Cur you know, the Indian restaurants. My uh, my boyfriend's father has a curry tree, and there's a um, an Indian man who owns a restaurant in Florida. And he comes to the backyard and he lets them pick the curry leaves. I mean, it's all coming from nature, and so yeah, Nothing. do it. That apple at the supermarket came from a tree somewhere so. yeah exactly so <laughs> so. do let us know what works for you and let us know you know if you're going to experiment with this and just let us know what you start to notice and what i'm already really fascinated is, is how long it is before people start thinking wow i'm really noticing i am feeling better with this so yeah. please let us know that as well it would be really great and it inspires other people as well absolutely and you guys i'm gonna say this too if there are any other slogans in the world that everybody knows that you want us to look at on a brief little coffee chat let me know too if there's another one of these i love i dig this shit i oh, i love it i love the videos you sent me and i was like this is such a great idea because we could literally speak about this for 10 weeks because oh my there's God, so absolutely. many bits to this jigsaw puzzle and when that penny starts dropping about Oh my God, you evil bleep. Yeah. yeah. Evil geniuses. And unfortunately, yeah. And very well done. But no more. I no will say too, the, the church was the one that was behind it all, you guys. They were the ones that funded it. So have a little think about that with the missing, you know, what Yahshua said versus the canonized Bible and the corruption, you guys, because the church was the one who funded it all. So anyway, you guys, well, uh, this was so fun, Catherine. I can't wait. It's really good fun. Great idea, Bryce. I Thank know. you. I'm Next week that we'll be over on Catherine's channel, guys. I'll have all her links there too. And again, Indian Indian viewers, let us know about eating with your hands and, and any other slogans. Let us know in the comment section below and your thoughts on this and let's let's revolutionize and go back it's not really revolutionizing isn't it it's just going back to the basics it's going back to how we were originally created so all right you guys we will talk to you soon bye everybody bye, -bye.